welcome to another GEMDS training video. In this video, we will be covering the basics of IPsec, also known as Internet Protocol Security, on the GEMDS Orbit MCR. This is part one of a multi-part series of IPsec videos. Please see our other videos on this topic. Before we get into the configuration of IPsec on the Orbit MCR, let's talk about why we would want to use IPsec. Let's say we have a local office that needs to reach a remote location which has an Orbit MCR 3G or 4G. One way to connect the Orbit and the devices connected to it would be to use port forwarding. While this would work for most people, it has its downsides. First of all, this method requires port forwarding rules to be put into place and can cause complications in some cases. Secondly, the data being transmitted to the remote site is not secure. This is where a secure IPsec tunnel will come in handy. With IPsec, we'll be able to secure all traffic going to and coming from the remote site, while also being able to route all traffic automatically with no port forwarding rules. So now that we know that we want to use an IPsec tunnel, the next step is to talk about what is involved in getting this tunnel up and running. IPsec tunnels always require an IPsec gateway on both sides of the tunnel. In our example, we have an orbit at the remote site. At the local site, this could be another orbit or some other IPsec gateway appliance. The next decision that needs to be made is if you want to use pre-shared keys or X509 certificates for the authentication. While using pre-shared keys is easier and faster to get up and running, using certificate-based authentication is more secure. Please consult your local IT department for their recommendation. If you choose to use certificate-based authentication, please see our certificate installation video, as this video will use pre-shared keys. Configuring IPsec on the Orbit MCR consists of the following. Configure the VPN service. This includes Ike policy, Ike peers, IPsec policy, and IPsec connections. Configure firewall service. This includes configuring local NETS address set, configuring a remote NETS address set, configuring an input filter, an output filter, and a NAT rule. Next, you'll want to configure the cell interface. Verify the correct input firewall filter, verify the correct output firewall filter, and then finally verify the correct NAT rule. Let's start at the top. In the VPN service, the Ike policy will contain the following parameters. Version, auth method, pre-shared key, PKI, cipher suite, lifetime, and reauth. The version command has three options, Ike, Ike v1, and Ike v2. Depending on the role of the Ike peer setting, the version command will have the following effect. For example, if the orbit is configured to be an initiator and the version is set to Ike v1, it will only initiate connections using Ike v1. If it were a responder, and let's say the version was set to Ike, it would respond to both Ike v1 and Ike v2 initiators. The version you select entirely depends on the IPsec gateway you are trying to connect to. Both ends of the tunnel must use the same version. If Ike v2 is available on both sides, then this is preferred. The auth method command also has three options. EAP TTLS, pre-shared key, and pub key. EAP TTLS is used for endpoint integrity. Pre-shared key uses a pre-shared key between the two IPsec gateways for authentication, whereas the pub key option uses X509 certificate-based authentication. The next command after auth method is pre-shared key. In auth method, if you had selected pre-shared key mode, this is where you would set it. Next is PKI. If auth method is set to EAP, TTLS, or pub key, this is where you would tell the device which certificates to use. Again, please see our video on loading certificates if this is the authentication method you wish to use. Under Cypher Suite, you will first want to give the Cypher Suite a name, as you can support more than one set of configurations. Next, you will be given the following options. The Cypher Suite you create will be dependent on the equipment you are connecting to. For example, if the IPsec gateway on the other side can only support AES-128 encryption, then on the orbit you will need to set the encryption algorithm to AES-128-CBC. Both sides of the tunnel must match. For most setups, the Ike policy lifetime can be left at the default of 180 minutes. If you wish to override the default, you can set this value within the range of 15 to 1440 minutes. The reauth parameter, when set to true, 
can be used to force the peer to re-authenticate when the tunnel is rekeyed. The value is false by default, and for most purposes, this can be left at the default. Now that we have covered the options in Ike policy, let's move on to the Ike peer setting. After you give the Ike peer a name, it consists of the following parameters. DPD enabled. DPD is also known as dead peer detection. DPD interval, Ike policy, local endpoint, local identity, peer endpoint, peer identity, peer identity no IDR, and role. DPD enabled can be set to true or false. If it's set to true, an established connection will be cleared on detecting a dead peer. If it's false, you're basically disabling the function. Under DPD interval, this is the time in seconds of the dead peer detection interval. Next is Ike policy. This will be the name assigned to the Ike policy we previously created. Under local endpoint, you have the option for address, any, or FQDN. Under local identity, you have the option of address, default, distinguished name, FQDN, or user FQDN. Under peer endpoint, just like local endpoint, you have address, any, and FQDN. Next, under peer identity, just like local identity, you're given the following options. The next setting is peer identity no IDR. This can be true or false. If it's true, this prevents the initiator from sending the IDR in its Ike auth request and will allow it to verify the configured identity against the subject and subject alt names contained inside the responder certificate. Otherwise, it is only compared with the IDR returned by the responder. The IDR sent by the initiator might otherwise prevent the responder from finding a config if it has configured a different value for its local identity. If you set this to false, the initiator sends the IDR in its Ike auth request. The final parameter under Ike peer is role. This can be the initiator or the responder. The initiator will start the connection to the peer, whereas the responder will just listen for a connection. Now we can move on to the IPsec policy. After giving the IPsec policy a name, you will have the option to set the following two options, Cypher Suite and Lifetime. The IPsec Cypher Suite will be configured similar to the Ike Cypher Suite. The IPsec Lifetime is the time which the IPsec Security Association expires. After creating the IPsec policy, we can take a look at the IPsec connection. The following parameters can be set. Failure retry interval, filter, host to net, Ike peer, IPsec policy, is out of band IMA, local IP subnet, NAT, periodic retry interval, and remote IP subnets. The failure retry interval can be set to change the connection retry time. The filter option can set input and output filters the same way you can set filters on any other interface on the orbit. Please see our other videos on this topic. It is recommended that you set the input filter to in trusted and the output filter to out trusted. The host to net option can be used to connect a Windows 7 or a Windows 8 machine via an Ike 2 IPsec tunnel. This option is covered in more detail in another video. The Ike peer parameter must be set to the Ike peer name we previously created. And the IPsec policy parameter must be set to the IPsec policy name we previously created. The is out of band IMA parameter can be left out as this is for using trusted network connect via Ike2 EAP TTLS transport. The local IP subnet needs to be set to any of the local subnets that you wish to be part of the tunnel. Note that on the other IPsec gateway, the remote IP subnets parameter must match this value exactly. The NAT option is used for one to one static NATs. This can be helpful if you wish to have overlapping subnets on both sides of the tunnel. If this interests you, please see our one-to-one -one NAT video. Periodic retry interval is 60 minutes by default and can be set between 15 and 255 minutes. This parameter is used to trigger IMA attestation. The remote IP subnets must be set to match the other IPsec gateway's local IP subnets exactly. If these do not match, then the tunnel will fail. Now that we have covered all of the IPsec parameters, we can move on to the firewall settings that will be required. If you are not familiar with how the firewall in Orbit works, please see our other videos on this topic. 
At the top of the firewall service is an address set called local nets. This is set to 192.168.1.0/24 by default. Make sure that you modify this parameter to contain any local subnets on the orbit. So for example, if you change the bridge configuration to some other subnet, make sure that you include this new subnet in the, the address set. Next you will want to create a new address set called remote nets. This will contain any subnets on the local side of the other IPsec gateway. An easy way to configure this is to match the remote IP subnets that you set in the IPsec connection. By default, the cell interface uses the rule in untrusted for the input filter and out untrusted as the output filter. It is recommended that you simply modify these two rules and do not create new ones. If you had set the input filter and the output filter in the IPsec connection to in trusted and out trusted, then you will not need to change the out trusted rule as it has been configured for you already. You will, however, need to modify the in untrusted rule. You will need to create a new rule to allow Ike destination traffic in and another rule to allow ESP traffic into the orbit. Lastly, in the firewall service, we will want to modify the source NAT rule to masquerade any non-tunnel traffic and to not masquerade any tunnel traffic. The commands to do this are all covered in the next video. Next you will want to verify that your cell interface is using the correct input and output firewall rules and it is set to use the mask or MASQ NAT rule. Finally, you will want to enable the VPN service and your IPsec tunnel configuration is now complete. This video only covers the concepts of IPsec within the GEMDS Orbit MCR. The next video will show how to configure the orbit. Thank you for watching another GEMDS training video. For more information, please see our other training videos and check out our website at GEMDS.com. <laughs>